Greetings and salutations. I'm the fallen angel Christopher Daniels. This is NXT superstar Dexter Loomis. This is the former intellectual savior of the masses, now known as Aaron Stevens, your NWA third degree national champion. Hey, this is Big Sexy Kevin Nash. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, it is I, Big E, but more importantly, it is you, the people of YouTube. You are watching Good Mike Work Commentaries, the work of a hardworking fellow by the name of Greg Morgan, 10-year veteran here on the YouTube scene. You know, this guy who runs this YouTube channel, he's a 10-year YouTube vet. I know you've been a fan for like 40 years. I've only been doing it for 30, so I guess we we're fans together there for, for, for 10 of it. This is Darby Allen, and you're watching the Good Mike Work Commentaries. Good Mike Work Commentaries. Good Mike Work Commentaries. Good Mike Work Commentaries. Yeah, 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 you better watch this channel. You better watch all the videos. Check out Good Mike Work Commentaries on YouTube. Check them out. If you don't, we're gonna have a problem. You're welcome. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with a really special retro pay-per-view review. This is a show that is very near and dear to my heart because I was there. I attended this show live. I had great seats for it. And my God, I have got a million memories to share with you guys today. I've been wanting to do this review for quite some time because my goal is to eventually do a review of every show that I attended live because I've been to a ton of pay-per-views and Raws and Smackdowns, and I eventually want to get to the point where I can review them all. If you are interested in listening to more reviews of shows that I attended live, I'm going to put a bunch of them in the description below. So please scroll down there and check those out if you want more, because I've been to a lot of great shows. And this one I kind of held off on because we're coming up on the 20-year anniversary of this show. Now, this is not 20 years to the day because this show took place really late in the month back in 2000. But I wanted to do a retro, at least one retro SummerSlam review for this year's SummerSlam. And I can't think of a better one to do than this one because I have just got a ton of of stuff to share with you about the show. It was a blast. Hope you guys are ready. Buckle up. As you know by now, and as I have said, this is going to be a review of WWF SummerSlam 2000 that went down on August 27th, 2000 from the Raleigh Entertainment and Sports Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina. And back in these days, the arena was relatively new. Uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't run a ton of shows in Raleigh. A lot of them, most of them were Greensboro, Charlotte, or Fayetteville. And being in the Carolinas and living there around this time was an absolute treat because WWE came through there all all the time. And North Carolina for a state, you know, it's it's a big state, large state, but you know, it's still not one of the major markets, but there are still four cities there that regularly had the WWE stop through there and they would hold shows all the time that were all within driving distance of where I lived. And uh, my buddy and I were talking today that uh, there was like three or four pay-per-views in the state of North Carolina in the span of two years around 99 and 2000. And I was at all of them. So I've got a lot of memories to share about this show because it was a blast. They have the attendance listed for this thing at 17,000. And two, which doesn't surprise me at all. This place was definitely jam-packed. This place was definitely a sellout. And I just remember the vibe and I remember the energy of it. It was incredible. My seats for this thing were also awesome. Now, unfortunately, unlike the Survivor Series 2001, link is in the description, by the way, where I was, again, on the hard cam, but instead of on the hard cam side, the hard cam was facing me. So I was pretty much on camera throughout the entire Survivor Series 2001 pay-per-view. You can see me the whole time. This time, I had extremely similar seats. I was pretty much sitting in the same exact spot, except I was on the same side of the hard cam. So if you're staring at the ring, I was on the right-hand side of the hard cam, and I had a really good view and a really good shot of Shane McMahon doing his big spectacular fall uh, off the set there later on in the show. So that's kind of where my perspective was. And I've got a picture here on the screen with a little section circled. I am somewhere 
in that circle. I'm not 100% sure where exactly my seats were. I just remember I'm in there somewhere. And it uh, just provided an amazing angle and an amazing view of the ring. I also had very similar seats for the Survivor Series in 2018 when I went to Staples Center and went to that show. Our seats were very, very similar to my SummerSlam 2000 seats. But what I remember of it the most is just how perfectly I was able to see the ring, how close I was. And I've said this many times before about going to wrestling shows. In most cases, not all, but in most cases, I prefer to be on the first level than the floor. If I'm not in the first two rows on the floor, I really don't care. I'd rather be up in the seats where I can see and where I can get my money's worth. And uh, this show was no exception. I absolutely loved my seats for this show, and I was really able to experience the whole thing about as best as a fan could ever hope for. Now, if I remember correctly... I always try to remember where I got my tickets for some of these shows. A lot of times, most times, I would have to go through Ticketmaster, which was a pain in the ass. You couldn't do anything online back then. When tickets went on sale, you just had to just hit redial, hit redial, try to get through, try to be one of the first people to order tickets and potentially get ringside or whatever. But another thing that they would do a lot is, at least in North Carolina anyway, and I'm sure they did this all over the country, if they had a big show planned, for that year but they were in the same town and in the same building several months before they would usually offer those tickets to the fans in attendance and i can remember a couple of different times at house shows they would say hey at intermission we're going to be back here in four months for monday night raw or back here in in six months for king of the ring tickets go on sale at the box office at intermission and we would just you know trample each other to get to the box office at intermission and try to get those ringside seats. We did that many, many times. Now, for this show, I'm not 100% sure, but the way I think it went down is I picked up these tickets on the April 24th, 2000 episode of Monday Night Raw that was also in Raleigh. I remember this weekend of shows because I went to Raw on the 24th, and there were also house shows going on during the weekend, and I think even a Raw taping the next day. But unfortunately, my grandfather passed away just a couple of days before this suddenly uh, while he was mowing the grass. It was actually my grandmother and my grandfather's 51st wedding anniversary. And he was in the backyard mowing the lawn and uh, he wound up having an aortic aneurysm and uh, just dropped dead right there at age 76. And it shocked us and it caught us all off guard. And this happened just a couple of days before, but I wasn't going to fly into Detroit to attend the funeral for a few more days. So I went. I went to the shows anyway. Even though I uh, just suffered a terrible loss, I remember attending the shows, and it was that Monday Night Raw that I believe that they announced the tickets were going to go on sale, and that's where I got my SummerSlam tickets. The only thing I remember about that Raw, about attending the show, is that it was the Raw that had Trish Stratus laying on the uh, tables in like lingerie trying to seduce Bubba like I remember watching her on the screen it was a backstage vignette to where she was talking about how she loves the wood and the way the table feels and doing some some sort of seduction of Bubba Ray Dudley that's the only thing I really remember about that raw but I was there and I'm pretty sure it was that show where I got my SummerSlam tickets I also had to as you had to do back in the day I had to trust my VCR now I always taped Monday Night Raw and I always taped pay-per-views every Every single month on the VHS tapes, but most of the time I was there. I was there to, to watch them and make sure that they got recorded. Now, it's one thing to do it off just TV because you can set your VCR and your timer to the USA Network or whatever, and it will record. But on pay-per-view, back then it was a whole different thing. You never It was so sketchy. I cannot express how much of a pain in the ass it was to order pay-per-view because you'd have to call ahead and they'd have to set your box to work and all that stuff. It's not like now how it's just all interactive and even how it got a few years later where you can order with your remote control. It was very hard back in these days, especially in the part of the country where I lived, kind of in rural North Carolina where, you know, they're just a little bit behind probably technology-wise than some of the bigger cities and stuff. So it was difficult. So I remember having to order the pay-per-view and pay for it and then set my VCR, set the timer, have the tape in, but also hope that the cable box behaved and cooperated and actually turned the pay-per-view on when it was supposed to because I had more than one occasion where the show didn't start and I had to frantically call the cable company be like, hey, it's not started and they had to like fix it for me. So I just had to trust that it was all going to work out and luckily uh, it did. 
Unfortunately, I could not track down any pictures of this event. I'm not even sure if I brought a camera or not because I don't remember really taking any. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to scroll some photos of the show that were taken by my buddy Daniel's boss. Now, Daniel went with me to all of these pay-per-views and shows. He's probably listening right now. And we were sitting up there next to the hard cam. Well, his boss was down on the floor, like up against the aisle near the entranceway. And he had what at the time was a pretty expensive camera. And he was able to snap some pretty good pictures of the show. Now, I know a lot of these pictures look like crap because I think uh, when I asked Daniel for him, I think he just took a picture of the pictures with his phone. So I tried to brighten them up and enhance handsome as best I could here. So these are the only personal photos of the show that I have to share with you. Um, Everything else is just going to be my experience and my memories. But as you see here, there were a few interesting moments that he was able to catch on his camera. And this was a pretty good show. It was very, very 2000 y I can't wait till we get into the results here because it was the exact type of pay-per-view that you saw around this time. And I can't remember the last time I've really gone back and watched this pay-per-view all the way through. It's definitely been over 10 years. I've seen clips here or there of the main event and of the TLC match and things like that. But actually sitting down here and watching it and listening to the commentary, it's been a long time since I've taken a look at this show. And also, unlike Survivor Series 2001, where I had tons of screenshots of me in the crowd, I could not get a shot of myself here. I was just at a really bad angle, and the camera was never up in my direction. So unfortunately, I don't have any of those to share with you either. But uh, that's quite all right, because I have a ton of other memories that I'm going to be hitting you with as we go through here. Now, Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler welcome us to the event. Jim Ross is on commentary saying that there was a $1.1 million gate for this event, which is... Just crazy, man. 17,000 people and over a million bucks. We had a pretty fun opener. It was right to censor, taken on Rikishi and Too Cool. And if there's one thing I remember more than anything about the Attitude Era and about this time period is how ridiculously ear-piercing, bleeding, awful right to censors theme music was and if you think it's bad on tv you have no idea how bad it was in the arena wwe had pretty awesome sound systems especially for their tvs and their pay-per-views when they did live events they would usually just use the house speakers and the house mics and stuff but when they were full-on production man wrestlers theme music would be very loud and right to censor was the worst of all of them because that just loud siren in your ear literally would hurt your ear and during this time since there were so many members of the right to censor on a lot of shows you'd see them come out more than once one two three times you'd have to hear that fucking theme song sometimes and it was a pain in the ass rikishi and two cools theme song however much easier to listen to we all loved that back in the day right to censor heads to the ring first and stevie richards gets on the microphone and he tells the north carolina audience that he's surprised that the right to censor is not more appreciated in the bible belt they should really welcome a faction like the rtc and of course the fans had none of that and booed the shit out of them that was great when rikishi and too cool made their entrance rikishi had two former godfather hoes with him one of which was victoria now the announcers made mention to something that i think stevie richards or the good father did to victoria on a previous show she was not victoria yet she was just being used as an extra she was even a, a raw girl i believe back in the manhattan center she used to carry around uh the signs and stuff so she was still a little ways away from becoming a full-blown roster member and having some pretty kick-ass matches in the next couple of years. So this was kind of all her beginning, and uh, they were at ringside to back up Rikishi and Too Cool. The match starts. The Godfather is on the outside of the ring with Grandmaster Sexe. They're brawling, and uh, the hoes go to uh, slap the Godfather. I think Grandmaster is holding him, uh, but he fights him off, and then he viciously throws both women to the ground. And again, I don't know why I'm surprised every time I see this. I remember the Attitude Era well. But when you look at this through a set of 2020 eyes, none of this stuff ages well. I mean, they just beat the shit out of women all the time. And it was crazy. I mean, granted, the good father was about to get slapped. 
But that was straight up assault, the way he threw them to the ground like that. Absolutely crazy. Uh, back in the ring, eventually, we get Rikishi getting the hot tag. The baby faces start kicking ass all over the place and cleaning house. The finish sees Scotty Tuhati going for the worm. I believe I'm Bull Buchanan, but I'm not sure. And that's when Stevie Richards nails him with a super kick right as Scotty's turning around uh, to start the worm. He just eats one right to the face, goes down. Stevie pins him, and the right to censor pick up the win. And lucky us, we get to hear that delightful theme song blasted throughout the loudspeakers right into our eardrums. Thank you, WWE. You are too good to us. We cut to a replay of Sunday Night Heat from earlier on in the night with Kurt Angle and Stephanie McMahon both arriving separately. And Jonathan Coachman, a very young Jonathan Coachman with hair, uh, is there waiting for both of them. And he asks both parties about the kiss, the big kiss that took place last Thursday on SmackDown. And now, of course, the main event of this show is going to be a triple threat for the WWF title, The Rock defending against Kurt Angle and Triple H. And on SmackDown, during a match, Stephanie had gotten knocked out and carried to the back, and Kurt Angle goes into the locker room and plants that big kiss on her on the couch in one of the most memorable moments of the year here in 2000. And they were kind of teasing that sexual tension between Triple H, or I'm sorry, between Kurt Angle and Stephanie, but Stephanie is with Triple H, and there was a love triangle being formed there, so uh, neither one really seemed that interested to talk about it with the coach, but later on, they will show Kurt Angle entering Stephanie's dressing room. After that, we get a Shane McMahon promo backstage with Michael Cole, who luckily is not behind the announce desk. He's still regulated to uh, the bitch role of interviewing people, which is awesome, and uh, Michael Cole asks Shane McMahon about what went on between his sister and Kurt Angle. And he basically says that Stephanie is his sister and he will support her no matter what. That's when he spots Steve Blackman. So he runs away. And of course, Shane McMahon is the current hardcore champion. And he's set to defend that title later on in the night against Steve Blackman. And we'll be talking about that one for sure in a minute. The next match we got was a DX battle between the Road Dog and X-Pac. Now, they had been doing the thing on TV where they were kind of having like a friendly rivalry, but it got a little bit heated and uh, tempers boiled over and it led to a match here at SummerSlam. And the referee is good old Timmy White. Always happy uh, to see Timmy ref in a match. Decent match here, but nothing great. It was only about four minutes. A lot of these early matches on the show really blew through quickly. So, you know, when it comes to like memorable SummerSlam, slam matches none of them took place in the early part of this card at all a lot of this stuff was largely forgettable um, about four minutes in road dog goes for a pump handle that was kind of his finisher at the time x-pac sneaks a low blow in with his feet nails road dog with the x factor and gets the pin wins the match after the match Pac gets on the mic tries to tell road dog hey no hard feelings and, and help him up and that's when Road Dog then kicks X-Pac and hits him with the pump handle that X-Pac blocked with a low blow earlier on. So the bad blood between those two continues. But this was a largely forgettable feud. I remember around this time, whenever DX was kind of in limbo or whenever Triple H was off doing his own thing, they could never quite figure out what to do with the remaining members of DX. It was like they were lost without the group. And this felt a lot like that with these two. I didn't really enjoy it at all. Now, uh, next up, we also got, I just want to mention this because I remember seeing it from my seat and wondering what the hell they were talking about. And Jim Ross goes on to plug a local steakhouse in Raleigh called Vinny's Steakhouse. Talked about how delicious it was. And Vinny's, I think, is similar to like a Morton's. I'm not sure if the Vinny's that they were talking about is still in Raleigh. If any of you live in Raleigh, give me the lowdown on Vinny's. Is it still there? Is it still operational? When I lived in Wilmington, we had several. The, the restaurant that I worked for and was the GM for, we actually had several different restaurants, all different concepts. We had a French place. We had an Italian place. We had a Spanish tapas. We had a steakhouse and, uh, and all sorts of different uh, concepts and ideas. And we did wind up selling our steakhouse, and a Vinny's was going to go in there. So they were kind of like a small regional chain, I suppose and the word was at the time that the owner was like a big fan of wrestling and he actually named the steakhouse after Vince McMahon now this is all by memory so I'm not really 100% sure but for them to take time to promote this steakhouse on pay-per-view 
I can't remember the story behind that or why they did it, but I remember sitting in my seat because, you know, when you're at a show, you can't hear the commentary. So I just see the, the Vinny's thing, and I'm like, what in the world is that? It wasn't until I got home and watched the pay-per-view on my VHS tape that I was able to hear that they are what they were talking about. And I found that to be interesting and just thought I would share a personal Vinny's story with you guys. Next up, we cut backstage to China and Eddie Guerrero. They have got a big Intercontinental title tag team match, another part of this time period that I wasn't a big fan of. They would put belts on the line in really weird situations, and when I think of SummerSlam and the Intercontinental title, I think of Brett Perfect. I think of Perfect Kerry Von Erich. I think of Brett Bulldog. Matches like that, just classic matches for the Intercontinental title. What I don't think about when it comes to the Intercontinental title are intergender mixed tag team matches. I don't understand why the title was ever put on the line in something like this, especially at SummerSlam. I mean, do this shit on Raw or SmackDown. So it's a minor, it's a minor complaint here, but I did wind up being okay with the finish of the match, as we will discuss here in just a little bit. Uh, they cut after Eddie and China to Val and Trish. China and Eddie will be taking on Val, Venus, and Trish Stratus in that tag, and uh, that means if Trish Stratus gets pinned, then Val, Venus, who is the Intercontinental Champion, loses the Intercontinental title. So he's very irritated, and he's irritated with her that she doesn't seem to care she's just comparing herself to china oh men would prefer to be with me than her and val is like look you need to get it together you are in this match and my belt is on the line and you are not going to screw this up for me type of thing and this was not my favorite val venus now he was really close i believe to joining right to center was he not because he had now cut his hair he was wearing the right the white trunks and the white boots he, I don't think he was in right to center yet, but he was about to be. And I liked uh, I liked the big Valboski with the long hair better than this version of him. And he was Intercontinental Champion on top of that. So it was not my favorite time period, I suppose, for the Intercontinental title, especially with all the talent in the WWE. I was kind of surprised with some of the people they were choosing to put the belt on around that time. Uh, another interesting little announcement happened after that. I cannot stress enough how much this used to annoy the shit out of me back in the day. But right after the Val and Trish thing, Jim Ross announces to the audience that tomorrow night's Raw is going to air at a special time of 11 p.m. on the USA Network. This was going to be in Greensboro, and I'm pretty sure I was there. I actually talked to my buddy Daniel on the phone today who went to the show with me, and neither one of us have any recollection of being in Greensboro for Raw. But at the same time, there is no way we would have missed that. There's no way we would go to SummerSlam and not Raw. Like, that would be insane. But for some reason, neither one of us can remember and have any memories of the following night's Raw. And I think Rock defeated Kane in a title match in the main event or something like that on the following night's Raw. So I'm sure we were there, but neither one of us can remember. Uh, I guess we're just getting old. But what was annoying about this is that this had to be the last year of it. I don't think this happened to them in 2001. I think it was over by then, but it might not, not have been. But WWE used to get bumped all the time for the U.S. Open, and that would always happen in August and sometimes in early September. And even prior to that on the USA Network, WWE back in the 90s, they used to get bumped for the dog show. The Westminster Dog Show or some shit like that just goes to show you how low they were on the USA Network totem pole back in the day. And here, when WWE is doing crazy numbers, crazy ratings on the USA Network, they are still second fiddle to the US Open. And in a show coming off the heels of a pay-per-view, a post-SummerSlam Raw has to get delayed two hours. That sucks, man. And I always used to get so annoyed with the US Open that it would do that to Raw. So I probably was there in Greensboro that night. I just don't remember it. And I thought that was worth mentioning as well. Now we get the big mixed tag team match for the Intercontinental title. Eddie Guerrero and China teaming up to take on Val Venus and Trish Stratus. Val is the Intercontinental champion. His belt is on the line here. If either one of them take the pin, they will lose or he will lose the Intercontinental title. And whoever pins Trish or Val will be the new Intercontinental champion. So backstage, you know, they had Eddie and China earlier on. And Eddie's like, hey, if you win, it's cool with me. I'm not the jealous type. He's trying to reassure China, who I think at that time was still just a little weary of Eddie. She was just a tiny bit suspicious. She totally didn't trust him. And you didn't trust 
steady either because you could tell, you know, in his demeanor, in his body language, and the little faces he would make that he was really in for himself. But he assured China here that if she won, hey, it's cool. No hard feelings. I got your back, babe. So that was kind of cute. The match, again, is nothing special. It only went a few minutes, a few tags in and out. Eventually, Eddie disposes of Val Venus, and China finds herself in the ring all alone with Trish Stratus. She presses her up over her head, slams her down, and pins her and wins the Intercontinental title. So China is your new Intercontinental champion. Eddie Guerrero gets in the ring and congratulates her and hugs her and raises her hand in the air and even helps put the belt on her. I thought it was very nice. Val Venus, of course, is pissed, and he's blaming Trish Stratus, and Eddie and China celebrate in the ring together. Now, when I was making my notes for this, I thought to myself, I'm like, huh, I've seen China win the Intercontinental title in person. And then I started thinking about other Intercontinental title changes that I've seen, and I've seen a lot, eight to be exact. I've seen Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, China, Edge, Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho twice, Christian and RVD all win the Intercontinental title in person. How lucky am I? So this was a nice moment for China. Like, even though it wasn't my favorite match, even though it's a, the complete opposite of what I envision the Intercontinental title at SummerSlam to be. I did not like the direction that things were going in at this time. Even though the Attitude Era was great, I felt that, that, I felt that the importance and the luster and just the prestige of the Intercontinental title was completely destroyed around this time. And it was just being passed around from person to person to person. And it depressed me a little bit. But I didn't have anything against China back then in those days. I liked her. And of course, now in her death, we all are just horribly saddened by the way her life came to an end there. And uh, we all feel that she was a trendsetter, a pioneer and should go into the Hall of Fame because that's where she belongs. And, uh, you know, looking back on it now as a, a 20 years later as a grown adult, I'm proud that I was in the arena to watch China win the Intercontinental title. I'm happy to have that in my little list of cool shit I experienced. So congratulations to China on her Intercontinental title win. Next up was another interesting match. This was Taz taking on Jerry the King Lawler. This whole thing got started on Monday Night Raw when Taz was out there bad-mouthing Jim Ross. Jerry Lawler was still a heel commentator at that point, but he couldn't just sit there and watch Taz abuse JR, and he wound up getting up and punching Taz and knocking him out, and that spark the feud between them this would continue on tv on raw and smackdown they would show a big video recap of the feud here and they did the deal i think it was on smackdown but i can't remember where jim ross was in a car in the parking lot and taz is on the outside of the car and he's got a baseball bat with him i think he spray paints the car and jr is in there all helpless and he takes a baseball bat and smashes the window and glass goes flying into jim ross's eye cuts up his face and apparently got into to his eye and he had to have all this medical treatment and medical attention uh, to save his eyesight, which luckily he did. And he, of course, is on commentary for SummerSlam alongside Jerry the King Lawler, who just sat there the whole time until his match starts. Taz's music hits. He comes out first, and he's wearing a, a cowboy hat, and he's got a walking stick. And that was one of the pictures uh, that uh, my friend's boss had actually taken since he was sitting right there on the aisleway. So Taz is out there with the hat, and he's pretending to be blind. He walks around the ring. He walks over to the announce table, and he's just making fun of Jim Ross. And that's when Lawler gets up from the announce table and decks him, hits him, and the match is underway. Lawler takes his jacket off, throws Taz in the ring, and the bell rings. Fucking hilarious. Now, another thing that I could notice from my seat, and I remember wondering what it was. From my seat, I could see that candy dish that they had, that Lawler and JR had just sitting there. But from my seat, I couldn't tell what the hell it was, but I knew it was going to come into play in this match. That's one thing I could tell just from sitting there. Now, Taz and Lawler brawl for a little bit in the ring. This was a very strange match because, you know, it pits ECW against WWE sort of because back when they did the ECW invasion back in 97 Taz and Lawler got into it a little bit I remember Lawler called Taz a midget and a little person and and Lawler had even uh, shown up on ECW TV a couple of times so Lawler even had that history with Taz dating all the way back like three years prior to this three and a half years prior to this so it's funny now to see Taz in the WWE and now these two are facing each other on pay-per-view if this exact match would have happened three years before I think all of the people in that are arena, including myself, would have been firmly behind Taz. But here, 
you know, Lawler was the baby face, and Lawler was uh, getting a lot of reaction from the crowd. He holds his own against Taz. Taz eventually kind of overpowers him after the ref gets knocked down. The referee is actually Teddy Long for this match. Back in uh, Teddy Long's WWE refereeing days, Taz lays down. He's got the Taz mission or the choke on Lawler very close to the ropes on the same side as the announce desk. So since the referee is knocked out, JR gets up from commentary, and here it comes. I knew it was coming. And he grabs that candy dish, which I'm sure was uh, just sugar glass, and just smashes it right into Taz's head. It explodes all over the place. Lawler just rolls over and pins him for the one, two, three. And the pop that that got is something that I do remember about this match because Lawler wins. The crowd goes nuts. I even remember from my seat, I had a perfect view of Jerry Lawler. He was basically standing right in front of me when he was celebrating on top of the announce table. I mean, it was just a great visual, awesome stuff. And another thing that was so great and hilarious about Lawler back in these days is that whenever he would have a match on a show, that he also did commentary for, he would just, he wouldn't like go to the back and stretch first. He wouldn't go to the back and do a bunch of push-ups or, you know, run around the arena and try to get loose. He would just come right off the the announce desk and get in the ring. And this is an old man. If, If anybody needs to stretch, it is Lawler. But he can somehow go in there and do the match. And then he goes right back. He doesn't go to the back to get a bottle of water or to clean up or anything like that. Sits right back down next to Jim Ross and would proceed to do commentary for the next couple of matches with with his shirt off. He just sat there shirtless the whole time calling these matches fucking hysterical. And a big win for Jerry the King Lawler. And this was one of my favorite matches on the show just based on the crowd reaction. Again, the match in the ring was nothing special. It didn't go very long. But the finish and the crowd being so happy and celebrating with Lawler. And Lawler getting a big victory in the South. You know, he was more, uh, you know, you know, Memphis and Tennessee than he was North Carolina. But still, he's in the neighborhood. Neighborhood. And uh, it's very cool to see him have such a big victory, you know, during that time in that part of the country. I thought it was great stuff and I marked out for it. Uh, next up, we had the big hardcore title match between champion Shane McMahon and Steve Blackman. This match was great because we all know it was building to one epic spot. The match gets underway in the ring for a while, and all it is is Steve Blackman just whooping the shit out of Shane McMahon, just beating his ass for several minutes constantly in the ring, which was pretty hilarious. Uh, They do find themselves on the outside of the ring. I think they fight down the aisle a little bit, but they spend most of the time in the ring. And a little while later, Test and Albert, TNA, who had formed a tag team, came out to help Shane McMahon, and I'm pretty sure it was Test and Albert that helped him win that title in the first place, if I'm not mistaken. And you know, not for nothing, it was kind of interesting to see test align himself with Shane McMahon because one year prior at SummerSlam in 99 test and Shane McMahon had a hell of a match over the uh the marriage of Stephanie or whatever that was I think like if uh if test won he could marry her or some some shit like that so we're just one year removed from that and test is now a heel he's teamed up with Albert and now he's on the side of Shane McMahon trying to back him up and trying to help him out so Blackman winds up fighting them off. They find themselves all the way down the aisle way, and Blackman somehow is able to dispose of Test and Albert and uh, leaving Shane kind of there to fend for himself. So Shane kind of scurries away. He has nowhere to go, so he begins to scale the scaffolding or scale the SummerSlam set, which is just the big metal pillars that tower so high uh, up in the air. And the minute he started climbing, the minute he started climbing, we knew what was going to happen. And I remember being a little bit worried because this is a very big stunt. And yes, we've seen the hell in the cell and we've seen some other things. But, you know, for him to climb all the way up there like that, I remember kind of half ass thinking that I was surprised they were doing that so close after the Owen Hart death. Now, this is not the same thing, but still, you are up very high. And if you slip off of that thing... You know, there's not a crash pad directly underneath you, I don't think. I think it was more off to where the the bump was going to be taken. So you could have still been very seriously injured here. And WWE didn't really do a whole lot with heights after Owen died. You know, they definitely didn't do uh, any more scaling down from the ceiling. And uh, prior to his death, they did the thing with Draws, where he climbed up to the top of the Titan Tron. I still can't believe he did that. You know, him and Hawk up there. I'd be shitting my pants if I was climbing up there because one false move, you fall, you die. So Shane climbing up as high as he did was making my palms sweat in my seat. I was like, oh, my God. And you knew it ain't going to be Blackman falling off this thing. You knew it was going to be Shane. So he starts climbing up there. Steve Blackman is hot on his trail, and he starts climbing up right behind him. And he's got a kendo stick 
in his hand. So Shane gets all the way up to the top, and Blackman is start, starts to whack him on the back with the kendo stick. And you can tell when Shane's up there, he's trying to get it just right. He keeps looking down, keeps looking at his feet. They've probably got a couple of spots marked for him. He keeps looking behind him. So it was very obvious, at least watching the pay-per-view back on the network, what was going to happen. But from my seat, it looked amazing because you couldn't really tell that there was all this positioning going on. It just looked like Blackman was whacking him on the back with the kendo stick. And then Shane just flat falls backwards. And, you know, I I swear an entire Beatles song played as he was falling. You could just you could just hear it. it was just such a long fall and then bam right through that crash pad, which, you know, was just a big probably airbag or something like that that broke his fall. But still a spectacular bump and one that maybe on screen on, on TV didn't look that great, but it certainly looked great from my seat because there's the one angle from the hard cam that I'll put up on the screen here. That's pretty much exactly what my view looked like when Shane was making that fall, because I was sitting right there. I was literally right there, give or take a couple of rows. So I was able to see Shane fall that long, long distance down into it. And then I believe Steve Blackman, I think he climbed about halfway back down the scaffolding and he jumped off and hit an elbow drop onto Shane McMahon and pinned him to win the hardcore title. And, you know, the fans, uh, you know, they popped hard. We got the holy shit stuff and, and all of that. It was very spectacular. And I'm glad that it was a bump that didn't shorten any careers. You know, I'd much rather have someone fall on a crash pad than do what Mick Foley did. And, uh, you know, many might say do what we're about to see here in a little bit in the TLC match, which was really crazy. We got a little bit of comic relief right after that, though, because they cut backstage to Stephanie McMahon, who, of course, is shitting her pants over what she just saw happen to her brother Shane. Kurt Angle storms into her locker room and she's freaking out. She goes, oh, my God, Kurt, did you see what happened to Shane McMahon? And oh, my God, this had me laughing out loud. Kurt Angle, bless his heart. He had no clue how funny he was. (laughs) He comes into the room and Stephanie's freaking out. And Kurt's like, oh, no, it's all good. He just got the wind knocked out of him or something. And he goes, look, he's moving. (laughs) Just the way Kurt says it, you know, and and, and his tone and his voice and his just like dorky way that he was back in 2000 had me cracking up. And my God, do I miss that man? God, Kurt Angle was uh, entertaining as hell. Uh, He then grabs Stephanie's like, oh, here, it's okay. I'll console you. And he hugs her and, you know, just being a dirty fucker. Uh, Mick Foley comes in and catches him hugging. He's like, aha, I knew you guys were shady and shit. And uh, he says that uh, Shane landed right on his kisser or something like that. And he's probably going to be okay. But Stephanie's freaking out and just... Kurt Angle's comedic timing, I don't even think he meant to do it. And that's what's so funny about him is that he had he had the type of timing that you would have to work on and practice and get better at for decades type of thing. You know, some some comedians who have been acting and and performing their whole lives never had that level of humor. And I think Kurtz came completely by accident. And that's what made him so great. God, he was so funny. Uh, Next up, we had another pretty cool match. Another match that I'm very proud to say that I was able to see live. Chris Jericho taking on Chris Benoit, two out of three falls. Now, one thing about this match I will say when it comes to Jericho and Benoit matches, this one is actually not really revered as one of the best. I think it's actually one of their letdown matches because they've had so many great ones. They've had so many great battles for the Intercontinental title. As a matter of fact, I was at that show. I believe it was in May of the same year, a couple months before this, May of 2000. It was in Richmond, Virginia, and it was a SmackDown show, and Jericho beat Benoit for the title. And I think it was a SmackDown taping. So you guys can check the date on that for me. I don't remember. But I was there to see that. And I think that match, I think, was just maybe a little better for me because we saw a title change. And then just a couple of months after this, or a few months after this, at the Royal Rumble, the two would just have an amazing ladder match for the Intercontinental title, which is one of my favorite ladder matches of all time. So in the grand story of Jericho and Benoit matches, maybe this is one of the weaker ones, but it was still a very good match, and it was two out of three falls. What more can you ask for? And I remember one of the reasons I was very excited for this pay-per-view and to see it live was because of this match. I'm like, holy shit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to see Jericho and Benoit again. I'm going to get to see Undertaker and Kane again. Unfortunately, those matches didn't really live up to the hype that I had in my heart for them, but it was still cool to be there for it. 
Now, this was great wrestling, like you would expect. I was still very... I was still very excited about all of the new good wrestling that had come into the WWE because even though the Attitude Era was great, I felt like WCW still had the better talent. You know, in 97 and 98, they had so many good wrestlers there. It wasn't until the wheels started falling off and Jericho came over and then the Radicals all came and they got Benoit and Eddie at once. And to see all these guys in WWE now, it was still very new to me. So, you know, because two years prior to this, this match would have been happening in WCW. So the fact that WWE had these guys now you know, I knew they were going to fare so much better there, and I was so excited to see them. You know, because back then I was a huge Chris Benoit fan. Match was very good. Typical stuff you would see from these guys. Benoit taps out Chris Jericho with the crippler crossface to win the first fall and then immediately locks it in again at the beginning of the second fall. Very smart move there. Jericho is able to fight out. Match continues, goes on for a few more minutes, and Jericho is able to then tap Chris Benoit out into the walls of Jericho. So they both have a tap out victory over the other to even the bout at one fall apiece. This leaves us with the final fall. they got some wrestling going on on the mat there. Chris Jericho goes uh, for an inside cradle. Chris Benoit reverses it and uses the ropes for leverage. Very similar to the Steamboat and Honky Tonk Intercontinental title finish, but not totally the same, uh, but kind of grabs a hold of the ropes. Referee doesn't see it, counts Jericho down, and Benoit dives out of the ring and escapes with the victory, two falls to one. So pretty good match, but like I said, maybe not known as one of their best, but still one that I'm very, very proud to say that I saw live. Good job by both guys. After the match, they cut to JR and Lawler, who are reacting to it, and Lawler still has his shirt off, which is just why Lawler in 2000 was awesome. I'm not a big Jerry Lawler fan. I kind of think he's a jerk-off because he blocked me on Twitter, uh, but I'm certainly not going to deny how ridiculously entertaining that guy was back in the day. Oh, man. Next up, deep breaths, everyone, for this one. TLC match. Champions, Edge and Christian defending the WWF Tag Team titles against the Dudley Boys and the Hardy Boys. Now, the Hardy Boys are basically in their hometown here. And back in these days, I went to a lot of shows in the Carolinas, and the Hardy Boys had a posse. I met the Hardy Boys' dad a couple of times. He would just walk around the arena and talk to fans and take pictures with them. And they also had this like this group of, I don't want to say groupies, but they were definitely people that they knew from their hometown. And uh, sometimes my friends and I would make a little fun about their appearance because they definitely look like some like a grim bunch. Let's just put it that way. They were always there and they were always in support and they were always loud. And the Hardy Boys, you know, they had the the support of the entire arena for this match because, you know, they're hometown boys. Now, all three of these teams, of course, wrestled at WrestleMania in a I think it was just a ladder match. And then they went one better here with a TLC match and then. The next year at WrestleMania 17, we would get TLC2, which they would then improve upon some of these insanely bonkers bumps that these guys would be taking in this match. So Edge and Christian come out first, followed by the Dudleys, followed by the Hardys, who just dive right in the ring and immediately start brawling with everybody. So this match is underway. Uh, Very early seesaw spot on Matt Hardy. This was a spot that they did about a year prior for the first time in that No Mercy match with Edge and Christian for the services of Terry. That was the match that really put these teams, or at least those two teams, on the map and gave the WWE the idea to say, holy shit, why don't we start caring about the tag team division because we have some really good teams here. And they would go on to have these matches for the next couple of years. And it all started at that No Mercy show. And I remember seeing the seesaw spot in that pay-per-view and remembering thinking how innovative it was. And they repeated that here very early on. Matt took it right to the face very brutally. And, of course, a few years after that, Joey Mercury would nearly lose his life in a similar spot, uh, getting his entire face caved in uh, with that very same type of ladder spot. So lots of carnage early lots of use of the ladders as weapons they were throwing at each other smashing each other in the face with it body slamming each other on top of it making ladder sandwiches with the wrestlers in the middle uh everything you could think of was taking place earlier on in this match they also had the big what's up spot with the dudley boys and i still remember that i saw them do that spot in person probably half a dozen times at least and the whole crowd would always participate that was that old uh wasn't like a beer commercial i think it was like 
Bud Light or something, and they do the what's up or whatever. So just pop culture for the time, you know, something that uh, I don't think the fans even know what that is now. But they used to always do that spot with Devon doing the headbutt uh, into an opponent's balls. In this case, poor Edge got his jewels nailed uh, by Devon, so we feel bad for him. But I remember Devon being up there in the whole entire arena uh, doing the what's up chant. That was pretty fun. Uh, Christian would then take a 3D through a table and uh, – that's one thing about Edge and Christian. I've mentioned this before in podcasts when talking about these guys because I remember back in the day during these these feuds and stuff, we didn't have really the internet per se. I mean, we did, and you had some message boards and chat rooms and stuff, but it still wasn't as accessible. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have all these places where we could just talk constantly about wrestling, but you were still able to hear fan critiques and complaints from time to time via hotlines, via magazines, or via a few other ways. And I remember around this time how much heat Edge and Christian had with like the audience, with the snobby, smarky audience. I loved Edge and Christian. I thought they were great, but I remember how much hate they got because they kept winning all of these matches now correct me if i'm wrong didn't edge and christian win wrestlemania 16 and both tlc matches i'm pretty sure they did and back in those days the fans used to get so mad because when you watch these matches edge and christian don't take the spectacular bumps the hardy boys and the dudley boys do all of that edge and christian generally take minimal abuse but they still win the match and i remember the fans used to constantly get pissed that it was unfair and it's bullshit that edge and christian get to go out there and do nothing and still win the match fans took that very personally i personally didn't didn't hate it at all because i thought that's what made them great heels that just added to it the fact that they're not going out there and killing themselves like everybody else is but they're still walking away with the gold to me it just added to their heat so i had no problem with it at all but it makes me laugh how how many fans were hard on edge and christian and uh thought they were pussies and everything when they would both go on to have pretty spectacular careers and when it comes to taking bumps edge doesn't have to take a back seat to anybody some of the things that he's done to his body in ladder matches and flaming tables and thumbtacks and all that stuff he would go on to do later on in his career in a singles run and stuff but back in these days edge and christian got a lot of shit from the fans after Christian took that 3D in the ring through the table, the first of what was three consecutive big spectacular bumps in a row took place. And this is kind of a repeat of WrestleMania 16 when Jeff Hardy was in the aisleway, climbed up to the ladder and did the big swanton onto Bubba Ray, but kind of missed and just landed right on his tailbone. They basically set this thing up again, except now they're on the outside of the ring. And instead of just one table, Bubba is laid across two. So Jeff has got much more room to kind of break his fall where he's just not landing ass first on the concrete. He does the big swanton off the ladder. Bubba moves and Jeff just explodes both tables on the outside of the ring. And this was around the time where I started really holy shitting myself because even though I had been to plenty of wrestling shows up until this point, this was my first time seeing something like this live. Like, I couldn't imagine what I would have been thinking if I would have had, like, ringside seats for King of the Ring 98. If I would have been in the front row to watch Mick Foley do what he did, it probably would have traumatized me for life. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have been able to comprehend what I had just seen. I just watched a man fucking die kind of thing. So for me to see this stuff and this type of carnage and these type of bumps for the first time in person was a pretty crazy and surreal experience. And I can only imagine one of my biggest regrets as a wrestling fan is that I never made a trip up to the ECW arena for one show, no matter what it took, just to be there, be in the audience and to experience something like that. And if I would have been able to make it up there for a pay-per-view or something and see some of the crazy bumps that went on in that promotion in that little building, that would have been probably even crazier than this. But to see this from my vantage point, from my seat and watch these guys start taking these bumps was pretty crazy to see in person. Uh, right after Jeff's big bump, Bubba does another one. Now, a lot of these bumps are repeats, either, either from the year before or what they would do the following year at WrestleMania 17, and this was very similar. They've got all the tables stacked up outside the ring, kind of in the aisle way. I think it's like four tables, two stacked on top of two. Bubba Ray gets the big ladder. All the wrestlers are, you know, injured on the outside of the ring, so he grabs the ladder, and he starts positioning it in the middle of the ring, but he's taking a long time, and he keeps looking at the tables, and he keeps looking at the ladder, keeps looking at the table, keeps looking at the ladder, 
better. That's my only critique here. Yes, you have to be careful. I'm very happy that Bubba was being careful, but holy shit, was he making it obvious that he's about to take a bump here because of his goal and purpose of the match is to get up and grab the belt. The the ladder is right underneath the belt, so just scurry up there and get it. The way he kept moving it and everything just really felt like he was setting up for a big bump, very reminiscent of what Shane McMahon was doing uh, on the big scaffolding with Steve Blackman. Eventually, Bubba gets the ladder right where he wants it. He starts climbing up the ladder to retrieve the belt, and that's when uh, Edge and Christian come into the ring. They slide under the bottom rope. They grab a hold of the ladder, and they tip it over, and Bubba just falls so far because it's one of those tall ladders, like those super tall ones, and he falls over the top rope and just explodes through all four of those tables. And that that spot they would recreate again at WrestleMania 17. And if I'm if my memory is right, I think it was Matt and Bubba that took that bump, right? Wasn't it Matt and Bubba that was up there and they fell off the same way? But instead of one guy crashing through all those tables, it was two, and it was much more spectacular looking. But this was kind of like this was the first one, and this was practice. So my eyes had just watched. Jeff Hardy fall crashing through tables. Now Bubba has just fallen 30 feet and exploded a bunch of tables into a million pieces. Now we're about to get another one. Uh, Lita would run out first. Lita comes out to try to stop Edge and Christian from getting the belts because since they pushed Bubba over, they're in there all by themselves. So they try to get up on the ladder to retrieve the titles and Lita comes in and pushes the ladder over, crotching both of them on the top rope in a great spot. So way to go, Lita. Uh, She pushes them both over and they're now now uh, out for the count and that's when it's Matt Hardy's turn to take the crazy bump so everybody in this match with the exception of Edge and Christian took crazy ass bumps in this match because wait until what Devon would do later on Uh, but Matt then climbs up the ladder next and I've referenced this particular table bump a few times before in podcast because I will I swear to you I will never forget it and Matt is now climbing up the ladder to retrieve the belts and that's when Devon comes into the ring. But instead of tipping the, the ladder over sideways the way they did with Bubba or with Edge and Christian on the on the crotch spot, he tips it over backwards to where Matt Hardy falls backwards over the top rope onto a couple of tables that are set up and positioned on the outside of the ring. And I will never forget the sound and the vibration that I felt from my own seat. And when Matt Hardy crashed through those tables and hit the ground, I felt it under my feet. And I could not believe it. I was like, damn, that's got to fucking hurt. You know, I just couldn't believe, like, I I guess my mind was just not able to comprehend that these people are taking real bumps here. You know, there's no pads. There's no cushion. You know, they are just falling flat on their fucking backs. And the fact that I could feel Hardy's body hit, I could feel the thud vibrating through my shoes to me blew my mind now when you go back and watch this bump on the network it's a gnarly sound it's this really kind of just disturbing sound of wood and metal exploding go back and watch that bump and listen to the noise it makes it's just uh it just makes you cringe you know at how uh just how awful it was and how brutal the bump was Right after that, when the officials, Timmy White and Jimmy Carderas, are attending to Matt Hardy, you see they both go, I'm telling you, go back and watch this match again. They both lift up their hands at the same time, and I think that was the signal for Edge to come running in with a spear and nail Lita. Because as soon as they did that, Lita is over there checking on Matt as well, and Edge runs in and just spears her hard to the ground. She nearly hit the back of her head on one of the ladders. And you can tell Edge is like laying over her, asking her if she's okay. This was five years before their big affair and everything. So they were just homies back in these days, but Edge was still very concerned about her and worried uh, that he might've hurt her. And you could tell he was like, are you all right? Are you all right? She's like, of course I'm Lita. I'm fine. And another spectacular bump, probably maybe arguably my favorite of the match is when Jeff Hardy and Devon, Jeff Hardy is now recovered from his crazy table spot He's climbing up the ladder, but so is Devon, and they both get up there to retrieve the titles, and Edge comes into the ring and pushes the ladder away, but they both hang on to the apparatus that's holding the title belts up there, so they're basically hanging and dangling, and this is another thing from my seat that just looked so spectacular, and you're wondering who's going to fall off or if somebody's going to somehow be able to grab both belts while they're hanging from that thing, and Devon. My God, Devon falls, and the way he falls, when you look at it on the WWE Network, it's exactly how I remember from my seat. Because when he landed, he almost came down sideways and landed on his shoulder. 
and his arms are just flailing all over the place. And I remember watching that bump from my seat thinking he might have seriously injured himself. I thought like when he landed, he just completely broke his arm. And that's why the arm looked like spaghetti. Because when you watch Devon take that bump, you know, I can't write if it's his right or left arm is just flopping around like it's a noodle. And I thought he had just demolished it. But it was just the way he landed, the position that he landed and the way the bump looked. It looked sick absolutely sick and jeff is still hanging on uh but edge and christian uh have ladders and they're smacking hardy with the ladder until he eventually falls off so that covers everybody bubba has already taken his big table bump jeff is no more matt hardy took his bump on the outside of the ring devon nearly broke his arm off and that just leaves edge and christian all by themselves in the ring to set up the ladder scale up there and retrieve the titles much to the chagrin of the crowd but much to the joy of me of young greg sitting in the seat because i had no issue with edge and christian back then i rooted for them i liked them so i was happy that the heels won there because it was just a great match it was a fun match and looking back i am surprised a little bit that they never gave the hardys or the dudleys a win in one of these matches i mean technically they did with the hardys because they did win that inaugural match back at no mercy the previous year but that was before these teams really got on the map you know every time they did one of these it was edge and christian winning it every fucking time so Good stuff there all around. A terrific match loaded with just crazy bumps. And I'm very happy to say uh, that I was able to experience that live because the sounds, you know, the feeling, the noises, everything that I was able to take in and absorb from being in person to see a crazy match like that is uh, definitely something I will never forget. Uh, We cut back after that match to the locker room again. This time, Stephanie's with Triple H in her locker room. Triple H is pissed off about the kiss. And he orders her to stay away from Kurt Angle. And it's funny, you know, back in these days, just the way we treated women, Triple H, who I know loves Stephanie with his whole heart, he is pointing in her face like an asshole. Imagine if your spouse or your significant other pointed in your face like that. You would leave that person tomorrow, male or female. Doesn't matter. Just the amount of disrespect there to me just cracked me up. And he's just, you know, he's forbidding her to do things and shit like that. So he's just real, real, real mad. Um, Next up was arguably probably the greatest match in the history of the WWE. I mean, arguably. We've seen some great matches. Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker at WrestleMania 25. Brett Owen at WrestleMania 10. Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon ladder match. We've seen some amazing matches throughout the WWE's history, but I don't think any of them are quite as good as the stink face match between the cat and Terry Runnels. That match was up next. I can't believe this match wasn't the main event. I think that's an absolute travesty. You should have moved Rock and and Kurt Angle and Triple H to the opener and put the cat and Terry Runnels in the main event. I don't think WWE knew what they were doing back then. But no, in all seriousness, uh, this is a just a buffer in between a crazy match like that because you can't have a ladder match and then go right into another major match. So this is our pee break match. This was the breather match uh, to offer a little bit of relief here, and it only went about three minutes. It was absolutely stupid. Um, the cat, not surprisingly, came out dressed very provocatively, and of course, Jerry Lawler was shitting his pants on commentary. Terry Runnels then came out next, and in the aisle way, she immediately starts stripping down to a bikini, which again, Lawler's very excited about. And that's when uh, Saturn shows up behind her and puts a towel behind her, because I think she was kind of accompanying Saturn to the ring around that time, and the cat had Al Snow in her corner. So there were a couple of... Uh, of uh, wrestlers out there with them, but it was absolutely stupid. Uh, The match went three minutes. Uh, Terry goes for the stink face, but the cat kicks her into the referee's balls. So her head goes right into the ref's balls and he goes down and that allows the cat to hit Terry with head that Al Snow had passed to her and then give her the stink face for the win. (laughs) Can't believe I said that out loud, but yes, that was the stipulation in the match you can only win by giving your opponent the stink face ay 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 all right that match is over we then cut to wwf new york i used to love this when they had that big restaurant in times square it's another bucket list thing that i wish i would have been able to do it didn't last long it was only there a couple of years but they had that big spot and they would run all the pay-per-view parties from there and i would have loved to go up there and attend one of those if any of you live in new york city did you ever go to wwf new york what was it like what's there now i don't even know what's in there now i think it's like a disney store or something uh but uh the rent alone for that place i think that was a 
losing venture uh, right from the word go, but it gave them huge publicity. I mean, they sh- they showed an outside shot of the restaurant, and it had the SummerSlam poster about 50 feet tall, just towering up the building, which was really cool. And I always enjoyed uh, the little things they would do at WWF New York, and they would always have wrestlers there uh, you know, to appear and, and cut to periodically throughout the show, and this time they had APA there. Uh, that's a good place for them to be because they can do plenty of drinking at WWF New York. So unfortunately, uh, the APA were not with me and Raleigh. They were up there chugging beer in Times Square. So very cool, and it's a fun part of the show that I miss. Uh, next up we had a very very disappointing match between the undertaker and kane on paper prior to this event i was excited because i'm like wow i get to see the undertaker and kane wrestle in person again i was at unforgiven 1998 i saw the inferno match i felt the inferno match i felt the heat man i've probably watched these guys wrestle a time or two in a house show as well Uh, but to see them twice on pay-per-view i was pretty excited for it but Man, did this match suck. Oh, my God, did this match suck. It was a no disqualification match. Kane and Taker were actually on good terms prior to a couple of weeks before this on Raw when Kane, out of nowhere, just attacked The Undertaker and chokeslammed him through the ring. The ring was gimmicked. Undertaker went through it. And that sent into motion the big split between the brothers here and their SummerSlam match. Now, another thing about the WWE Network, I know I I complain about this a lot, but they had The Undertaker's American Badass music dubbed over with that shitty theme, that you're going to pay theme. Oh, my God, that was awful. Isn't it kind of funny? The Undertaker's probably the only person in history that can at least be in the argument for the greatest theme music of all time and the worst theme music of all time because that you're gonna pay song sucked now i'm no kid rock fan so i'm not upset that i didn't get to hear american badass but as much as i hate the dipshit and i'm no big fan of limp biscuit either i honestly gotta say that i think both themes kind of fit undertaker relatively well for that badass especially the kid rock version yeah i'm not i'm not sure how i feel about the Roland song but it grew on me you know as time went by but uh they're not going to pay the royalties uh for those songs on the network so they dubbed it over with that crappy theme which sucked um the match never starts that's the annoying thing about this it's a no dq match So I don't know why the bell, just ring the bell. It doesn't matter if they're in the ring or not. Just ring the fucking bell. It's no DQ, but it just turned into a brawl right away. Both guys start brawling with the chairs on the outside of the ring and the stairs. Kane goes, uh, he picks up the stairs and he goes to hit Taker with them, but he hits the ring post instead and the stairs uh, backlash back into Kane's face, cutting him open. Uh, Undertaker is hell bent on getting that mask off of Kane. For some reason, they never alluded to this on TV. Undertaker never said, I want to unmask you. Nothing like that. He just started going after his mask. And again, I'm sitting there in my seat wondering what the hell I'm looking at here. These guys are just fighting. The bell has never rang. And Taker is trying to rip off Kane's mask. And he almost does once. He actually tears. Uh, like the top left corner of his mask off, exposing half of his eye and his forehead. Now, it was still really tough to, to see it from where I was sitting. It's very hard to see it on the WWE Network as well because Kane has so much hair, but you could see the blood and everything on Kane. And finally, I think it's about seven minutes this takes. That's all this match lasted. It's not even a match, just a brawl. Finally, Taker, you know, he keeps motioning the audience that he wants to take the mask off, and he finally gets a really good grip on it, and he pulls it off pulls the mask right off of Kane. You briefly see his face for like a millisecond. I couldn't see shit from where I was sitting, but he definitely pulled it off to where you got a quick little glimpse at his face and he's got his hand over his face and he's kind of pointing at Taker and that big bike, Taker's bike is sitting there right in the aisleway and he almost fell right over it. That might've been a little bit funny if he would have, if he would have actually fallen, but he basically just retreats while pointing in anger at the undertaker and the undertaker's music is playing. And that was the end of it. Very confusing. I didn't really know what was going on because I couldn't hear the announcers and I had no idea what they were saying about it. And I don't think I even really noticed that the match didn't start. I didn't. I just thought Kane was running away because he was unmasked. But man, after the classic and epic encounters these two guys have had and their feud that dated back, you know, all the way, you know, three years prior to this up until this point, the Inferno match, the WrestleMania match, all the other things they did. This was a ridiculous letdown, man. Just a terrible match. One of the worst matches on the pay-per-view. Maybe slightly better than the stink face, but not by much. Um, We cut backstage again to Triple H and Stephanie in their locker room. 
Kurt Angle is in his locker room pacing back and forth, uh, debating whether or not to call Stephanie on the phone. So he does. And Stephanie answers and Triple H is standing right there. And she's like, oh, hi, mom. And Triple H is like, oh, it's your mom. I want to say hi to her. And then she's like, "Okay, Hunter wants to talk to you. And he says hello. And nobody's there. And he goes, your mom hung up on me. But of course, uh, that was Kurt Angle. That was kind of funny. And that leads us to the main event. The Rock defending the WWF title against Triple H and Kurt Angle. Now, back in the locker room, Kurt Angle, I'm sorry, Triple H had told Stephanie to stay back there. He doesn't want her anywhere near Kurt Angle. He doesn't want her anywhere near the action. He just wants to take care of it on his own. Now, Kurt Angle and Triple H got the title shot because I believe they did a number one contenders triple threat match, either on Raw or SmackDown. It was Jericho versus Angle versus Triple H. And... Triple H and Angle double pinned Chris Jericho. They were both laying on top of him, and the referee counted three, so they couldn't decide who the winner was, so that meant Rock had to face them both in a triple threat. And when you tie in the whole love triangle thing here, it made everything really interesting. Kurt Angle hits the ring first. He gets on the mic, cutting a promo like only Kurt Angle in the year 2000 could do. He says that he's sorry. He's sorry that he didn't kiss Stephanie earlier. (laughs) That made me crack up. He says that Triple H is just mad because he showed his wife the type of passion that he never could if his life depended on it. So Kurt Angle has got balls of steel. This guy has not been around for very long, and he is literally poking these bears, you know, threatening their their livelihoods with their wives and everything. It just cracked me up. I don't think Kurt Angle, the character Kurt Angle, understood what deep shit he was really in uh, for doing some of these things, which was part of his charm. That's why I liked him so much. Uh, Triple H's music hits. He comes out like a raving madman. He gets right in the ring, immediately starts brawling with Kurt Angle, and they're all over the ringside area fighting with each other. He grabs him and pulls him over to the table, and this is when the big pedigree table botch happens. And this was so bad when you go back and watch it. At first, I was uh, I wanted to make this as my thumbnail, but I, I wasn't able to get like a good, clear shot of it. So I actually rewatched this like 10 times when I was trying to get myself a good thumbnail for the video that I didn't end up using at the end anyway. But I kept rewatching the bump, and my God, Angle's head just hits so hard. So Triple H has got Angle. He's bringing him up on top of the announce table to hit him with the pedigree. And right when he goes to hit it on him, the table collapses early and they both fall angles arms of course are up in triple h so he's got no way to break his fall and angles face just goes bam right on the side of the table and right onto the floor and you knew right away that kurt angle was injured you could see triple h talking to him on the ground from my seat i could tell that the table collapsed early but i had no idea kurt angle was really really injured and it's one of those situations where Man, WWE is lucky. They landed on their feet with this because I think, and I I don't know for sure, but based on what I could see here, what I think the plan was is exactly what they did. I think the plan was for Triple H to actually hit the pedigree on Kurt Angle and for the medical and the medics to come out and deal with Kurt and take him away for a while and then he'd come back out. But he really, really got injured to where the medical attention that he was going to receive that was going to be worked medical attention turned in to shoot medical attention where he really needed it. So it, it's funny how that all worked out, because as we'll talk about here as the match went on with Kurt Angle being taken to the back and then Stephanie convincing him to go back out there. I think that had to be the plan all, the whole time because it would have been really hard to call those audibles. You know what I mean? Kurt Angle takes the bump. Triple H tries to buy some time getting out the sledgehammer. That's when the Rock's music hits because the Rock hasn't even made his way out to the ring yet. So they obviously sent the Rock. They're like, okay, go now. He goes out there, starts brawling with Triple H and starts having the match while the doctors and the medical team tend to Kurt Angle and they start rolling Kurt Angle out of the arena on the stretcher. So they're, they're taking Kurt Angle away. Triple H eventually chases them out into the aisleway and starts uh, punching Kurt Angle a little bit on the stretcher. So that tells me that that was the plan. He actually was supposed to take the pedigree and get carried out by medical officials, but he was really hurt. And Kurt Angle, I believe, suffered a concussion uh, on that spot. Man, it was brutal. It was so ridiculously brutal. Uh, The Rock and Triple H continue to battle in the aisleway and back into the ring, and Stephanie then comes back out. Triple H tells her to get the belt, so she runs over, and this is another thing that just made me laugh so hard. It blows my mind how much WWE used to straight-up abuse poor timekeeper Mark Eaton. 
Triple H is in the ring. He sees Stephanie. He goes, hey, go get the belt. Go get the belt. So Stephanie just storms over to the uh, timekeeper's table. And little, helpless, non-threatening Mark Eaton is standing there. He would have gladly just given her the belt. But instead, she just bitch slaps him right across the face for no reason at all. After Triple H uses the belt, I think he still, I think he sends Stephanie back. He goes, "Get out of here! You know, I don't want you to. I don't want you anywhere near this or whatever." So Stephanie leaves and goes to the back, and Triple H continues the match with The Rock. Now in the back, they show Stephanie talking to Kurt Angle, who's been receiving medical attention all this time. He's on the stretcher, and she's like, "Kurt, please go out there and help Triple H. I'll do anything." And Kurt's like, "I'll do anything for you, Stephanie. I'll do anything for you." Now we couldn't hear any of this from our seats. I don't think. I don't remember. I don't remember hearing this on the the, the, tron, the tron or the screen. So this was all going on behind the scenes that the pay-per-view audience could see. I just remember seeing Kurt Angle coming back out to the ring. So in the back, Stephanie convinces Kurt to go help the very guy that put him on that stretcher. And so he does. He gets up and he goes and runs out to the ring. Uh, Triple H, as Kurt is arriving, hits the pedigree on the rock, which should end the match, goes for the pin, and Kurt Angle grabs him by the foot and pulls him out from underneath the rope to cost him the title and then runs in the ring and tries to pin the rock for the win and almost gets away with it. And this is now when Kurt Angle just becomes unbelievable. This is a guy that's brand new. He's been around for a year. He's been around for less than a year, like really wrestling on TV. He's had a little more training than that. But in terms of being on TV, we're talking about 10 months, 10. He debuted right after the survivor series in 99, right on TV. It's SummerSlam the following year. This fucker is in the main event wrestling hard, wrestling at an unbelievably high level minutes after suffering a concussion. Kurt Angle, are you listening? You are the fucking man, my friend. My God. To be able to do what he did with his level of training, what a stud. What a goddamn stud he is. I'm serious. Man, so impressive. He's just in there wrestling his balls off right after being seriously injured like that. Uh, unreal. Uh, Rock would then hit a rock bottom on Kurt Angle, but then Triple H breaks up that three count. And that's when Stephanie finds her way back out there. Triple H instructs her to get the sledgehammer. You know, I think Triple H is going to go for a shot onto Kurt Angle. He ducks and, and Triple H actually punches Stephanie McMahon and she goes down. So he hits his wife by accident. She's out like a light. Uh, the Rock disposes of Kurt Angle and then hits the people's elbow on Triple H for the win to retain the WWE title. It was quite a match, and it was um, quite a wild ride in terms of WWE really having really having to kind of wing it because I'm sure it was pure and utter panic at Gorilla. I can only imagine what Vince and Bruce and everybody back there was saying. They were probably losing their damn minds. But Kurt Angle, much to his credit, that botch really didn't affect the match that much because the way it was structured makes me believe that exactly what happened was what was supposed to happen. Kurt just wasn't supposed to get hurt that bad, but I think he actually was supposed to get medical attention. He was supposed to leave the match for a while and come back, and all of that really, really worked out. Uh, but in the end, The Rock retained the title, which made me happy because I remember at the time, I didn't really want to see him drop the belt. I didn't I didn't really want to see him lose to either one of those guys. So I was I was cool with him uh, retaining and I wanted him to because I felt like he had already dropped the title, you know, to Triple H earlier in the year. He had also dropped the title and he would go on to drop the title to Angle in a couple of months. But to lose it here, I thought would have been kind of weird and out of place. And we had just had a triple threat. In the previous SummerSlam, in the main event, so it's two years in a row now, uh, we got a triple threat title match in the main event. We saw a title change the previous year with uh, Jesse Ventura and McFoley and all that stuff, and we didn't need to see it here, so I was very happy with The Rock's victory here. Um, Angle is then attending to Stephanie McMahon. Triple H is laid out in the ring after the people's elbow and Kurt Angle, very much like Hogan and Elizabeth back in uh, back in the main event when the mega powers split up. Uh, Angle picks up Stephanie and carries her away and starts carrying her to the back as um, as Triple H is laid out in the ring and the rock is celebrating uh, in the aisle way. I remember when I was at my seat, the rock, he climbs up to the uh, a, par a piece of the set. Looks like a big jungle gym like you would see in a playground in a school. Climbs up to the top of that thing and, and lifts his hand up in the air and poses with the belt in a great moment. I had a great view of it from my seat and a great view of this entire pay-per-view. Anyway, if you guys have any memories of this pay-per-view, if you watched it live, what you think of it now, any opinions you have on it at all, I would love to hear them in the comments below. So please hit me with them. 
I promise to do a lot more of these as we close out 2020, and I'm going to try to find a few more shows that I attended live and do reviews on them uh, coming up here in the next few months. So be sure you keep a lookout. I hope you guys enjoyed this review. You guys take care, and I will catch you real soon for another one. Y'all be good. Peace. Peace.